So, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. My name is Sarah, and I study international communication in the Nottingham University. And I'm also the uh, assistant curator of this film festival. And today, we're very glad to invite Stuart uh, to our panel. And Stuart, you can say hello to everybody, yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me. Okay, so today we'll discuss some uh, question and some topic about the film, The Six, and also about the narration and the story behind the film, the production and the historical issue and the sustainability, which is our the film festival theme this year and with Steven. And uh, uh, please let me introduce you uh, briefly. Okay, so uh, the student is a writer with over 25 years old of working experience in China, and he specializes in culture, technology, and uh, maritime history, and has published books such as uh, uh, Jiangya, Chinese Titanic, and Poseidon, the China the Secret Sewage of Britain Lost Submarine. And he's also the chairman of the Explorers Clubs East Asia and South Asia chapter and a member of the Royal Geographical Society. Okay, so uh, do you want to say anything else? Yeah. No, it, it makes it, it makes me sound like I've done a lot more than I have. <laughs> Thank you. Also, okay. So the first question is about your China China uh, experience. So because I learned that you can speak Chinese perfectly and you study Chinese language and literature, journalism, and work in China for more than 25 years. So could you please give us more details about your trip in 90, uh, 1985 and what made you decide to uh, study and live in China and work in China? Sure, well, at the time I was, I, uh, you know, in 1985, I was in high school. Yeah. And um, I was already thinking about a career in journalism. Uh, but I thought I was going to go to Washington, D.C., do political journalism, something like that. And then my mother got an offer to go to China as as just as part of a tour group. Um, and I don't think we had any specific interest in China. But at the time, it was it sounded really interesting. There were um, China was just kind of opening up again after not, you know, not not being available for many years. Mm -hmm. And um, excuse me, the um, I my mother was not really excited about traveling but but i really was and uh i i encouraged her i said you know you really have to go on this trip and she said well why do i have to go and i said well because you know if i had the same chance i would go and so um she said well i didn't know you want to go if, if you want to go we'll both go mm -hmm. and um at the time it was you know being fairly young um it's possible that no matter where I went at that time, you know, if I had gone to Africa or if I had gone to another country in Asia, uh, excuse me, the, um, you know, it would have been, it would have had the same impact. But, you know, to go to China at that time, um, you know, when it was just starting to open up and just starting to develop, you could see that that there was going to be such momentous change. You could see that there was going to be, you know, just giant social shifts, and and you know, at the time, uh, you know, people wore you know Mao suits and and rode bicycles, and you know, it was just just really underdeveloped. But you know, you could see it wasn't going to stay like that for long. And I thought, wow, if you want to be a journalist, then this is this would be the place to go. You know, this you, you know, the, you never run out of things to write about if you came. To China, and if I've been right about one thing in my life, that was what I was right about. Um, you know, China was, and and still is, really the best story going, and and there are still so many stories um, that that are left untold. And uh, so uh, after that, I just kind of changed my focus, and I said, okay, well, what do I have to do here? Do I have to? Should I learn to be a journalist first, or should I? You know, start learning Chinese language first. So, when I went to university, I um, I started to learn Chinese, um, the the language, and uh, then um, I went to graduate school for journalism. And then uh, after that, the the first chance I had to move to Beijing and start working, I I took it. So so that's how I arrived there in 1996. 
Um, I understand. So uh, based on your uh, living experience, observation and studying, do you think uh, what is the main obstacles for the Western world to learn about China or Asia? Well, I think I think I think there's a lot. Um, I think, you know, anytime you're dealing with, um, you know, a country that doesn't speak the same language, the first thing you have to do is you have to learn that language. You know, it's it's um, it, it always amazed me how many journalists were there and still did a pretty good job, but but didn't speak the language themselves. And, and for me, that that just would have been impossible. I, I, I would not have been able to accept that. Um, so, you know, I'm glad, I'm glad that I, that I started learning language from an early, an early point. I think also, you know, understanding the history of a place is absolutely critical because even though, you know, you're dealing with people in a, in a contemporary setting, you know, you can only deal with people today. There's sort of so much that's, you know, culturally and socially in the back of people's minds um, you know, and, and collective things that are shared, you know, so much of, so much of culture is, is historical, you know, it, it comes from some previous event that may not be obvious. Um, so I think those two things, especially in, in Ch China's case are, are absolutely critical because even if the average person doesn't know much about history, or if they don't really, uh, pay much attention to it. Um, it. It's you know you you hear and see references to China's history every single day when you're there. You know whether people actually understand it or not. You know it's 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 talked about all the time. It's referred to all the time. Um, and so I think especially in that case, um, it's critical. And I think learning you know learning the language of a place where you live, I mean, that's just basic respect. That's just, you know, it's, it's, it's very nice if people are nice to you and they happen to speak English and, and so forth. But, you know, if you're going to live someplace for, you know, more than a few months, then, um, you know, any, any, any amount of the language that you can learn is, is of great assistance. Um, but I think the another possibility is the way of understand the history, understand the society. Because I believe um, recently the, the world is dominated by the Western country and Western culture. So how to understand Asia and understand China is through uh, otherness or Orientalism perspective. Do you agree with me? So is this also an obstacle for people to understand Asia, understand the Oriental society? Well, I I, I would agree with you that that so much history is subjective, but you have to start somewhere. You know, you have to start with, I mean, even a even a history of China written by, you know, someone from Britain in 1870 gives you a perspective on the way that place was at that time. You know, to us, it's history. To them, they were writing it um, from from their contemporary perspective at that particular time. So, um, you know, we can always filter out things, you know, something that we tried to do in the six was we tried to uh, create an objective history of what had happened. You know, we, we, we were, there was so much, so much of Titanic history is subjective because we want certain people to be heroes. We want certain people to be, you know, the, the tragic victims. Um, we want to blame some people um and and re, we really wanted to strip that away arthur jones my our director and and my co-creator and and good friend you know when we looked at it we thought well if we're going to do this then we really need to you know just pull up pull everything away you know it was like it was like it's the funny thing is is that titanic history is very much like the titanic wreck site is now it's just kind of covered in these barnacles it's got this stuff that's you know, the time and pressure and 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 seawater has just, you know, wrapped it in. And and that's nice. But but the problem is then you can't see the wreck itself. You can't see, you know, the way that it was. And and so our our objective was to get rid of as much of that as possible. I'm not interested in somebody saying, oh, well, I saw this or I heard this on the rescue ship or I, you know, did that or whatever. What we wanted to see was, well, what does physics tell us? You know, what does, excuse me, what does, what, 
what is actually possible because something that's lost in a lot of history, whether it's Titanic or China or whatever, is that there are certain things that are just not possible. <laughs> there are things, you know, we still live in a world that is governed by physics, that's governed by chemistry, it's governed by biology. So you can say that somebody did, you know, this or that, or, or you know, they hid somewhere or, you know, um, you, you, can, you can look at things that way. But the reality is, is, you know, we're, we, we live in a physical world and that physical world limits a lot of what we can do. And so that's kind of what we set out to do. So to, to, to answer your question a little bit more specifically, you know, we can only read, you know, the history that's available, the, the, the people that, that went out and, and wrote it. Um, we can go back and re-examine it, which, you know, we certainly did in this case. Um, but I think we always have to look for, for what the facts are. And again, it, that, that goes back to learning the language. You know, mm -hmm. if you can read Chinese history in Chinese, obviously it's going to be different than reading Chinese history in French or reading it in English or German or, you know, or, or even Japanese. So, um, you know, though, though it, it really depends on what you want to get out of it. If you want to get a great story out of it, then it's easy. Then you, you know, you just, you, you read what you want to read and you come up with your story. But, but I think to, to genuinely understand what happened, um, you know, you need to go really deep and, and as much as possible in, uh, the original language. Okay, so you said you want to review the history from the own culture perspective. That is my understanding. Yeah. So my next question is about what's your opinion and how do you see more and more Asia film, Chinese film, Eastern faces gaining international recognition? And in sure. Well, yeah. I mean that was, I think that was inevitable because, first of all, if you just look at at the at the sheer number of films that are produced. Um, in China, in India, in, in, in other Asian countries. And, and frankly, the quality of those films, um, you know, I mean, China has been, China, Hong Kong, um, you know, as, as um, I'm, I'm thinking more in terms of different languages than, than, you know, different places, but, you know, the, the, the films that we saw come out of Hong Kong in the, 60s 70s 80s and their influence you know the yeah. the sort of um fourth and fifth generation of of directors you know coming out of uh mainland china excuse me and you know just it, that that was inevitable it was inevitable that people were going to be curious about them and then you know they they were being made at such a high level from from the very beginning um you know, of, of each of those periods, each of those generations. I mean, it's just, you know, it was inevitable that, that we were going to start to know those names overseas. And I think, um, you know, film is so universal. It, it's, you know, you don't, you don't really have to know that much about uh, a culture and certainly not the language uh, with the help of subtitles, at least to be able to, you know, look at a film and say, God, this is a beautiful film or, or, you know, the, the technical level of this film, you know, the way this is edited is as good as anywhere else. Um, you know, it, I just think it was, it was inevitable. And then, I mean, you know, again, just, just talking in strictly in terms of numbers, I mean, the, the, the size of those markets and the number of people that are involved in those industries, it was just, it was just inevitable. Now, you know, we've, we've seen attempts by Chinese directors, you know, I'm thinking specifically of, of mainland directors, but, but, you know, also directors from, from Hong Kong and, and, and stars from, um, uh, you know, from both places, you know, try to, try to break in, in, um, you know, in Western film, um, you know, probably Bruce Lee is still the most recognizable, you know, um, film star um to to you know the average westerner i think that's kind of sad not that bruce lee wasn't a great actor not that he wasn't highly influential but you know you've also seen success with you know jackie chan um you've seen um i mean fem bing bing really gave it her best shot to to break in and um you know i didn't i don't think she did anything wrong i just think you know that her their her timing and the, and the roles that she chose were not perhaps not the the, the kinds that, that were going to make her a star. I mean, um, probably film fans remember Gong Li better than they re, than they remember 
Fan Bingbing. So, um, but I think that opportunity is still there and it will just, my prediction is that it'll just happen very naturally. It's just yeah. something that will, you know, you can't, you can't force it. Somebody will get the right role at the right time. And so, I mean, look at, you know, if you look at K-pop, for example, I mean, why is K-pop so popular? What's so different about it than, you know, other, other, you know, pop acts that we've seen from, from different places, but, you know, now all of a sudden, you know, every, every kid in America has, you know, Blackpink or BTS on their, on their phone. And it, it's just, just happened very naturally. And I don't think anybody even thinks about them being, you know, not from the U S so, um, you know, so, so I guess we need to stay tuned for that. Okay. I understand. And I noticed that there's one difference in your documentary is because many traditional documentary often use a narration to tell the story from the beginning to the end. But why did you choose to break away from the tradition and tell it from the researcher's point of view? I mean, you appeared in the story and you are a very important part of the story. Well, I mean, that that's that's a, a director's choice. Um, and I think Arthur Jones would direct would would disagree with you uh, <laughs> about, you know, the tradition of documentary. I mean, there are there are, you know, a lot of documentaries that have, you know, would be on top 10, top 50 lists that that have no narration. Um, and of course, at the time that they were made, yes, they were considered non-traditional. But I think now more and more um you know, documentaries made for TV will use narration, but but okay. more feature length documentaries will sort of let the story tell itself almost. I mean, I'm the I'm the tour guide, let's say, through the story. Um, but you know, it, you know, Arthur and I have very different approaches when it comes to to these projects that we do because I I really am not a filmmaker. I I you know, I can barely take a photo with my iPhone. So I, I just don't have the tools to do that. And I don't have the vision to do that, which is one of the reasons I wanted to work with Arthur in the first place, because I knew that he did. Um, but, you know, for me, as as the researcher and as the, you know, it, at least so far, the the, the ideas guy, um, I, I want to, you know, I have a very specific goal. I'm trying to find out something I want to learn something. I want to discover something. And if that doesn't happen, then I'm very disappointed because by then I would have spent a lot of time and a lot of, you know, resources, um, you know, trying to do that. And then if in the end, if, you know, if the trail goes cold, then you think, well, geez, that's, you know, that was a waste of three years or, you know, we didn't, we didn't reach the goal. We weren't successful. I think Arthur has a much different approach. He's, you know, he's interested in the characters and he's not only interested in the journey of the of the Chinese men that were on Titanic, but he's interested in the journey of of, you know, myself and the research team, mm. um, you know, where, you know, what what's it like when, you know, let's face it, six people sitting in a room with a bunch of laptops is not really that exciting. You know, if you if you film two hours of that, you would not have a very successful documentary, I don't think. But you know, it's those moments of discovery, like, oh, wait, look at this. Wait, look at these photos. You know, the, the names are different. You know, look at this, you know, or, or you know, in our, in our first documentary, The Poseidon Project, there's a moment where I'm basically sitting outside the, comp you know, that, the, the housing compound of somebody that, you know, what could have been an integral part of our story. And I'm speaking very bad Chinese to him on the phone and trying to convince him to come and talk to us. And, and he says no, and he hangs up. And, and, you know, for me, that's failure. But for Arthur, you know, that that's part of the process. You know, you're not always going to succeed. You're not always going to find what you look for. So, you know, um, for, for him, the, the, I mean, of course, I think the viewer goes along with us because they are hoping that we're going to find something and be able to tell a larger story because of it. Um, but I think for, you know, again, for, for Arthur and for me, you know, our goals are somewhat different and our feelings about the outcome, um, is, is also somewhat different. Okay. You mentioned failure and difficulties. I, I remember the director also mentioned this in his interviews, for instance, some difficulties like, uh, the names of the six survivors and, uh, uh the names in the archives are unreliable. So you are some genealogist 
to uh, for help, but they reject. I mean, they turn you down because this is too difficult. So how uh, can you or your team to overcome the difficulties you encountered in your research? And what is the belief or motivation that keeps the team going on? Sure. Well, um, I mean, we had a very big team um, all together. You know, I think at one point we had 16 people that worked on, you know, different parts of, of the research. I mean, we did we did ultimately have some success with genealogists um, because they were, you know, they also thought it was a great puzzle and a great way to kind of test their skills. And, you know, it, it's you you can only ask people to. Um, you know, you can only ask people to do their best. And um, in 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 this case, you know, what, what we tried to do in the beginning when when the only researchers were were Arthur and me, we thought, OK, these names are really going to be a problem. This this is going to take some time, you know, and we need to get more information about this. OK, so then what can we do right now? And that's when we started to turn towards the physical um you know, the physical problems, let's call them in the story, which were, you know, are there men hiding in a lifeboat? Um, how could we prove or disprove that? Um, you know, how, how do we not rely on unreliable accounts to tell our story? And and what could we do that was different that hadn't been done before? You know, we're, I, I mean, I, I have an interest in maritime history, but Arthur does not particularly. So for him, he doesn't really care what people who've looked at Titanic before have or have not done. Um, you know, so, you know, for me, I cared very much and wanted to do something very different because that was the only way that we were going to make any kind of a contribution to Titanic history. So, you know, working on those physical problems, how did they get off the ship? Why did they survive when so many died? You know, what, what really happened you know those were things that we could work on directly and we decided well even if we can't take the family story further then maybe we can you know do something smaller and just kind of work on on this bit of of titanic history and then in the meantime i mean you know something that can't be discounted in a, in a story like this is luck you know we've been very lucky we were very lucky on our first project and we're, we were very lucky again this time and and you know you make yourself ready for luck by by preparing properly and by doing as much as you can but at the same time you need that luck you know you need somebody who calls you and says hey my grandfather you know was one of these people or you know whatever you need you need people who you just need to get lucky um so you know we had a nice combination of all of those things I mean, I'm personally disappointed that we were not able to tell more of the six stories fully. You know, I wish I wish we had been able to carry them forward. But, you know, the reality is, is that these were not men whose goal was to be remembered. You know, that that was that was not what they set out to do. And so as a result, they didn't leave behind a lot of records. You know, maybe there were records, but those records have been lost or destroyed um and so we just had to go with with what we had so it's a it's a it's a chance you know we we are eternally optimistic when we start these projects we absolutely believe that we are going to find every bit of whatever we set out to find um and i really have no idea where that optimism comes from um probably arthur more than myself um but but um you know, you have to believe, you have to believe you're going to find it. If you don't believe you're going to find something, I guarantee you will not find it. But in our case, we really believe that we would find family members. We believed we would find descendants. We believed we would find their stories. And at least in a couple of cases, we did. So you never imagine you will be failed or this team cannot find a result. Because at the beginning, it's just start from a very, very small clue. You never, you, from the beginning to the end, you believe yourself. We, we absolutely believed. Yeah. I mean, it, you, you have to, because, mm. you know, the, the reality is, is that, um, I mean, the, the, the documentary maker today is really spoiled for choice. You know, there are so many wonderful stories to tell and, and, you know, it's so, 
uh, accessible, I won't say easy, but accessible to tell them, you know, if I really want to go out and shoot a documentary, I'll charge up my iPhone and go out the door. And then, you know, I can, I can probably even edit it very crudely on that iPhone. And then, you know, I have a global distribution network known as YouTube that I can upload it to. So in terms of making it and getting the story out there, you know, it's, it's, it's so easy today. It's so, you know, it's, 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 it's so ex again, I shouldn't say easy, so accessible, but you know, when we looked at, we actually started working on a, on a different project that, you know, and, and, and the six came out of that project. It was not a Titanic project. It was a, it was a maritime history project. It was a, a shipwreck project, but, um, you know, and and so, you know, to have two wonderful stories that we wanted to work on and and have to choose one of them, I mean, that's great. Um, it was just a story that we just thought if we don't do this now, we're gonna we're gonna regret it because somebody else will do it, and we'll say, gee, that was our story, and we we could have done it, but you know, we chose not to. So, um, you know, it, it's even it, it, even if we had had to put this back on the shelf and say, gee. There's just not enough information. We'll have to maybe look at it another time. Um, we spent three to six months in the beginning just trying to prove to ourselves that that there was no story there, which sounds strange, but, um, you know, because, of course, we needed, you know, to find funding and we needed to find, you know, people to work with us and so forth. And if you can't convince them that there is a story then they're not going to do any of those things. So first we had to prove to ourselves. So we thought, all right, let's just make sure that we've got something here. Let's try to follow up all these loose ends and, and, you know, see if we're just, you know, if this is just a wild goose chase or, you know, is there something really there? And at the end of, at the end of that period, we really thought, okay, there's something here and we should go forward. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's like, anything, you know, it's, it's rehearsal, you know, if, 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 you know, documentary makers always like to get everybody to believe that everything is just exactly as it was at that moment. And some people do shoot that way. But, you know, I think the, the most of what you see is, is you know, planned to an extent, or at least um, arranged to an extent. Okay, you mentioned there must be some story. And this film is not only about the six people, but also about some historical issue. For instance, the Chinese Exclusion Acts act and uh, like the paper sums, something like this. So my question is, did you and your team have any ideas or plans for how to tell the film at the beginning of the research? Or you found some difficulties and you realize, oh, there's some historical issue behind the six peoples. So if so, how did you, the narrative presented shift or different, or I mean differ from your original plan? That's an excellent question. So you know, when we started out, because because we didn't know what we were going to find, you know, we had a basic idea. Here's how we think this is going to happen. And frankly, I don't think Arthur would have worked on it if it were only a Titanic story. You know, if it were if it were if the story had only been these men were on Titanic. Here's how they got off. You know, here's maybe why two of the six died. And, you know, there's the story. That's it. I don't think he would have done it. Um, that might have been interesting for me to a point. But it was it was only when we did enough research to see that one of them goes to the US, one of them goes to Canada, one of them goes to the UK. It's like sometimes you see these experiments where they'll take, you know, a thousand, you know, little rubber duckies and, you know, let them go in, you know, I don't know, somewhere like Southampton or somewhere like, you know, New York Harbor or somewhere. And then they, you know, people think that they're just going to all kind of float together and end up in the same place and they don't. And in, in this case, you know, what we're really, we could have picked any eight men or any six men from, you know, from China in 1912 and followed their stories. We could have done that if we, if we were, you know, trying to tell that kind of story. But I thought by, by using the Titanic as a peg, you know, as a, as a time peg, um and saying okay the story starts from this moment and and you know then where does it take them you know it gave everybody enough background that that's the thing is that whether it's in china or or in the west 
people yeah. know the Titanic story now, you know, that might not have been true before James Cameron's movie was so popular in China. But, you know, it was in terms of, you know, what what does 1912 mean? It means that, you know, obviously in China, the, what's what was going on was quite different from what was going on in a lot of other places. But, you know, people still say, OK, it starts from here. So that saved us having to tell a lot of backstory and and, and providing a lot of historical um context but at the same time you know a lot of a lot of people didn't know uh, or didn't know very much about the chinese exclusion act they didn't know about policies that were in place in the uk they didn't know about you know exclusion laws in canada um and you know I, that that i think really was the exciting opportunity of the of the story was to show how these men were sort of you know, almost literally pushed back and forth across the Atlantic by these different events, you know, by, um, you know, by, by labor events, by labor opportunities, by World War I. Um, and just, you know, the idea that the whole time, you know, at least one or two of them had, you know, they were thinking about, you know, I, I want to go to one of these countries, I want to establish a life for myself there, I want to be a merchant, I want to, you know, open a restaurant, you know, I just want to go there and, and uh, and have a better life for my family there um you know that that you know at the end of the day i mean sure you can you can make documentaries about things you know you can make documentaries about animals you know but really you know for us certainly for arthur and me that the most stories are you know we're of course we mentioned some of the big titanic characters but the reality is is as much as possible our story is about these you know these men and and what happened to them um so you know it, it's uh it, it's it, the more the more you can show what happened to a single individual the more relatable it is you know it, it's because not everybody's going to be the leader of their country not everybody's going to be a, a movie star not everybody's going to be a, you know a, a famous inventor um you know but if you look and say oh this this person had this experience I had an experience like that. I can understand, you know, how that felt. Um, that makes it a lot more personal and and a, and a lot more relatable. Okay, I understand. And uh, uh, at the end of the film, I noticed uh, straight lines of credits following up on repelling the Chinese Exclusion Act in the U.S. and Canada. And it's also notes that the U.K. has hasn't yet to apologize for the deportation of the labors publicly. So I also believe recently, right now, there are a lot of racist uh, discourses and anti-immigration policies still be uh, prevalent. So do you think there any the story of the six men has any inspiration or relevance for the present? How do you think the history relates to the present? Oh, I mean, it, it's 100% related. Yeah. I mean, the especially for Chinese immigrants in the West, because their, their history isn't so long. You know, I mean, yeah, there, there are, you know, if you go up to Boston, you can see the, you can, you can visit the grave of, you know, one of the very first um, Chinese people who's, who came to, it wasn't even the U.S. then, it was the colonies, you know, but, uh, you know, came and, and, you know, settled here and, and so forth. I mean, but, but really and truly those histories are not particularly long, either here in the U.K. or, or, you know, elsewhere in, in Europe or the West. Um, I mean, I think, something that that the film and the research taught me is that these are not new problems you know we didn't look out our window yesterday and say hey there are a couple of chinese guys over there you know let's let's hate them you know or they're not like us let's you know dislike these people and treat them poorly um i think those are you know those are old problems but i think that gives us perspective that they're not going to be solved quickly and that we shouldn't seek you know quick solutions that that you know, we need to work through them. We need to understand them a little better. Why do we feel this way? What caused it? Um, and then what can we do about it so that we don't continue to, um, you know, to make the same mistakes? I mean, that that was something that the story of the six taught me was, you know, we were looking at this aspect of Titanic history. And for more than 100 years, people had just repeated the same stories that had first come out in 1912. These men hid. They were stowaways. They dressed as women, and so forth. And nobody ever just, 
you know, took a few days to kind of dig into it. And, and, you know, is this even possible? You know, who says that, you know, who said this? Where were they? Could they have seen this? Was this their personal experience? Or are they just, you know, making up a story? Or are they just repeating something that they heard on Carpathia on the way to New York? You know, it didn't, it, it did take a lot of work, but it didn't really take that much work, you know, to, to realize that those stories just had no merit. And so, you know, in, in, in terms of, in terms of racism and in terms of, you know, the, these, these policies of discrimination, it, it shouldn't really take that much work. I'm not trying to simplify, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to diminish a, a very significant problem, but at the same time, you know, it, it's, I think, to be honest, I think the average person would never treat someone that's not like them, that's sitting next to them on the bus or working at the decks next to them or playing with their children in, in the same playground. They're just not going to say, you know, there. It, it's always the other, you know, that Professor um, Professor uh, Chung says in the film. I, I think it's the best line in the film, to be honest. Or I think it's the best statement in the film is. He talks about the other in Kaja, you know, in, in Chinese yeah. it's Kaja. And, and, you know, the idea that it's always the unseen other, you know, it's not, it's not a specific person. It's not your neighbor who's Chinese. That person's okay because you know them, you know, yeah. um, it's, it's, it's those other people, those other Chinese people, those other immigrants, those other people from some place that seems, you know, wild and mysterious, you know, because, because then you're not, then you you never have to come face to face with it. If you had to, if people had to walk up to some to someone from another group and and express the feelings that they have in their heart for whatever reason, I, I, very few people would do it because they couldn't face that person, couldn't have that person stand there and say, "No, I'm not like that. No, that's not correct. No, you're wrong." Um, and and you know, people need to need to face that. And the more that they see stories about you know i mean following son the the you know our main survivor i mean he taught me a lot about being an american he really taught me a lot about what it means to be an american and how badly you know people want to be i mean I, you know i was lucky i was born here but you know some people work really hard to get here and i i, I just think that's i just think that's a lack of respect when when people pick on immigrants and you know that that's really unfair it you know, of course, it's, you know, it's racist and it's discriminatory, but but at its at its heart, it's unfair. That's what bothers me about discrimination in America, because I, I like to believe that we as Americans believe in fairness, you know, that at the end of the day, it's, you know, we try to be fair to everybody. And, and, and that's what really bothers me about seeing people mistreated in that way is it's just not fair. This, per, you know, these this person is working so hard. You know, be here to support himself, to, you know, make a life, to be part of the society. And, and you you treat him like this. And that that really bothers me. Um, it, it's just it's just so basically unfair, um, you know, not to mention morally wrong and everything else. But it, that that's what really gets me about it. And so, you know, if if. You know, we haven't gotten um, wider distribution yet in the United States. And what, you know, I think that's really sad because it's not just a Chinese American story. It's not just an Asian American story. It is as much an American story as anything else that's out there. You know, it's not, it isn't a great success story, but guess what? Most, pe most people's stories are not, you know, maybe at the end of their life, they say, oh, I I had a couple of kids and, you know, I had a nice little house and so forth. You know, they feel okay with it. Maybe it wasn't a wild success, but, you know, but Feng Wing Sun's story is so much like that. And there's so much to be learned from it. Um, you know, I think it just deserves a wider audience for that reason. But uh, you mentioned Asanas, but Asanas also include Black people. From my understanding is in UK or in United States, there are more discussion in social media about uh, white and Black. So my understanding is it seems like the Asia people, especially the Chinese people, are marginalized in social media. So and uh, besides uh, Chinese culture is more gentle, so Chinese people 
they don't like to fight for their fights. So do you have any like wish or any specific um, like want people to change towards Chinese? Because I don't believe we can understand the race problem, the Chinese and the black people in the same way. They're different. Yes. Um, I, I, I'm, I wouldn't dare to say too much about those subjects because I think I, I'm I'm just not enough of a of, of of an expert to to say anything intelligent or meaningful. But I think that you know there there of course there are not as many Asian Americans um, you, you know in in the United States as there are other groups, um, and it, you know a lot of that has to do with geography. You know if you're in a place like New York or if you're in a place like California, you are going to have more interaction with with you know uh, Asian Americans than you are um, in other places, but not necessarily. You know the funny thing is is that you go to just about any town in America and there's a Chinese restaurant. Yeah. You know it's 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 shockingly universal. <laughs> you know you you're probably more likely to find a Chinese restaurant in a small town than you are a McDonald's. Um, and you know those people have been there for decades and. I mean, look at look at Tom Fong, you know, Tom, Tom Fong, you know, owns a 100 year old Chinese restaurant in a town in Wisconsin, and the community absolutely loves the Fong family. OK, I mean, they, you know, I don't know, maybe there are people there that that don't like them or, you know, have you know negative feelings about them, but they are as much a part of the community as anybody else. And um you know, I think if people just, again, don't, people need to avoid othering. It's not, you can say, oh, well, Tom and, you know, they're okay. But, you know, those other people, you know, that's, that's what we have to get away from. It's always the, and especially now in, in um, specifically in American politics, it's, it's always, you know, that other side, whoever the other side is, it's always, you know, the, those people. Um, and, and I, you know, that's, it's, it's, it's just dangerous. Aside from being ignorant, it's just dangerous because, you know, we, the reality is, is we all have so much in common, you know, it, there, there's, there is so much in the human experience that we all share, but also on a, on sort of a national level, you know, the person that lives next to you, they, they live next to you because they're of the same economic class. They probably have a similar background. They probably have a similar level of education. Mm -hmm. So, you know, why, why be so upset over them being there? Um, you know, if they don't clean up their yard, that's something different. But if, you know, just, just on a person to person basis, you know, it's just not, it's, it's not a big deal. And I, I think if people were a little bit more willing to go out and, and, and learn about, the people next to them, not only would they feel better about them, but they'd probably learn a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, again, that's one of the reasons I hope that that we find a bigger audience here, because I think a lot of people really relate to the story. I mean, sure, you know, 20 or 30 percent of the film is in Mandarin or is in, in um, you know, what was in, uh, you know, Toysan or, or, you know, but, you know, for the most part, people can understand it. They can read the subtitles. It's you know, it's not a, it's not like I'm asking them to sit through 90 minutes of nonstop Chinese language, you know, with subtitles. So, um, you know, I think they they learn learn a little bit if if they could, and and you know about a very relatable subject. Okay, the final question is a little bit big and general because uh, you mentioned about the human rights and the equality. So there's a, a part of the sustainability. So what is your understanding of the sustainability in global level? I'm sorry, could you could you repeat the last part of your question? Okay, so you mentioned human rights, equality, and something about this. They're part of the global sustainability. So what is your understanding of the sustainability in like global level? S and sustainability? Sustainability, is that, yeah. Hmm. Wow, that is a very big question. Um, well, I mean, I I um I can't remember the last time I used the phrase human rights. <laughs> so that's uh, I learned that's a phrase I learned not to use a long time ago. But um, um, I mean, you know, the so today I'm sitting in New Jersey and um, the last two days, the, 
the air here has looked a lot more like what I remember Beijing than than you know than than the usual blue skies we have here. You know, we had you know big fires up in Canada and the smoke came down and and you know um, the idea that we can just kind of live in our own little part of the world. You know, those those days are long over. You know, we have not lived in that world probably for at least 75 years you know the the sad thing is that is that world war ii in many ways brought us together as a planet um you know we decided to go fight each other but you know that was really the first time a lot of people went and saw the rest of the world um and and you know i mean i'm i'm wondering if this sofa that i'm sitting on was made in china and and you know i'm you know, I can look around this room and I wonder how many different countries the, the, the things, you know, were made from by workers that I'll never see. And, and uh, you know, it, it, it just kind of if, if a fire in Canada can cause problems in New Jersey, yeah. um, you know, that's just one tiny little uh, example that, you know, something that happens halfway around the world does impact me sitting here and it's not because i lived in china for 25 years um you know of course when things happen there i'm concerned about you know friends and 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 you know others and um but you know it, it it's we don't we don't all have to love each other but you know we have to we have to understand each other you know that's you know you don't we don't all have to play together or you know, work together, or whatever, but, you know, we, we really have to co cooperate and respect one another on a, on a very basic level. Um, and we're already seeing both the benefits of that. And, you know, we're seeing the, the, the negatives of that when, when we don't do it. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's, I think anybody who is, uh, has a relationship with China or is in China and has a relationship with the West is very upset right now because, you know, it's, it's like our parents are fighting, you know, that's, that's the thing is that's the, that's the way I feel about it is it's, it's, you know, that that's a simplification, but you know, it's like when your parents are fighting, you don't want to pick a side and you just hope that they get over it. You know, you hope that, that, that they're able to fix it um, because it's just not great, you know, when they don't get along. Um, so, you know, I really hope that I don't, I don't know that, China and the West are going to have the same relationship that we had maybe 10 years ago or 20 years ago, um, which is sad because that was really wonderful. You know, it was really, it was really great when we were all kind of going back and forth and, you know, interacting and, and, you know, all the exchanges and so forth. Um, but, you know, the world is a better place with the, you know, with, with us getting along than it is without it. Um, and, and we shouldn't think otherwise. So, you know, I, I really hope that, you know, globally, we get to realize that it's, it's time to work together, or, you know, we're not, we're, we might run out of time. So, um, you know, that's, that's not the, uh, that's not what I set out to, you know, to do when I, <laughs> when my friend and I made a movie about, you know, Chinese men on the Titanic, but <laughs> hopefully we can contribute a tiny little bit to that. Okay, thank you, thank you. So, is there any question from the audience? If you have, you can just directly ask. Hi, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, please. Oh, yeah, uh, great. Thank you for the wonderful, great discussion. I think both of the uh, discussion and documentary are great. Actually, I don't have any question, but I do have some reflection or uh, comments on your discussion, it, it, especially about uh, the reflection part on the uh, early 1920s or 1910s. I, mm, I mean, in the moment, because it, it's kind of a time of uh, political correction because we have Michelle Yu uh, wins the Oscar and we have Anime Wan being reprised as a trailblazer. However, I think maybe it's, it is also a great time to look critically to that uh, period of time, but which is actually uh, being less discussed. So, which I think 
why this discussion is especially wonderful because you did you 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 do provide a very critical perspective in looking at that period of time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it, it, it's a very rich period of time to look at. I mean, there's a, you know, there's a reason that, you know, for example, Jiang Wen likes to make movies that are kind of set in the 20s and 30s. It's a, you know, it's a little bit of, a little bit of a chaotic period, but it's, you know, very rich yeah. in terms of stories. Yeah. So, um, exactly. Was, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, is there any else question and comments? Okay, so that is our today's discussion panel and um, you inspired me a lot. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. 谢谢,谢谢。那今天就我们到这里,拜拜。好,谢谢。